Hi, hello, welcome to Telugu Radio Facebook Live. Wednesday on immigration by Garrison Law Firm, Burgos and Garrison Law Firm. Hey, it means we, we took the long break uh, last three weeks. We did not have a show due to the Christmas holidays and New Year's. We are coming today with uh, the latest updates and interesting points, and uh, we can dis discuss more more inform more points and information on the immigration system what is going on these days uh, today i think um, uh, trump had the impeachment so i don't know what is going on here so lucas will give the more information in the latest uh, immigration administration process trump administration and we will get the new uh, point from the Biden will take oath on January 20. So we'll get the more information. What will Biden do after once take the administration? So we welcome to Lucas. Hi, Lucas. Welcome to Telugu and Narai Radio. Hey, Venkat. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Glad we're all safe and back at it. Um, you know, want to welcome all of our viewers and, um, you know, everyone uh, paying attention to this. You know, it's going to be an exciting new year and uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of change coming through. Yes. So how was the Christmas and New Year? It was good. It was, uh, you know, a good break, uh, you know, and hopefully... Uh, it was with you as well and your family and everyone else who's watching and uh you know uh, hopefully we have it we we started off the new year on a, on the right foot um and uh you know except for any issues that might have happened in our capital <laughs> hopefully that the, this next year goes smooth as well okay so uh lucas just we had a the recent even the Trump had the only less than 10 days, but he brought uh, the new rules. He implemented the new rules. Can you give the, some more points on that one? Who are affect? Uh, maybe this uh, recent changes will uh, continue to in Biden administration or Biden will have a, any chance to get back these rules? Well, that's a very good question. Um, and so it's a complex answer in the sense that it depends on which will, rules that uh, we address and refer to. And I just want to start off, I think, since you put the announcement out um, late yesterday, uh, the president has a proclamation about people who need to travel. OK, so any foreign traveler trying to enter the United States has to show that they have a valid uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So I know there's a lot of people, I've spoken to many, many of my clients uh, here where maybe their parents have expired or there's some other emergency and they have to travel. Uh, and so now it's just one more hurdle that we have to navigate where we need to have the vaccine. And we don't really know, you know, if you travel back to India and you're able to get a vaccine there, is it the same a vaccine that would qualify as like a Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine to qualify to come back in. So we're still monitoring that uh, closely. And that's something that I would imagine that uh, Biden, uh, once he's sworn in as president, is a healthier movement with uh, numbers of people being vaccinated uh that that's first and foremost second you know we did have uh, i think we spoke uh last time about this new uh rule for the h1b cap um and that rule did go into effect and uh, what we're referencing here is how trump wants to design the lottery system to make sure we um I guess, select people who are paid the most. And so this doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best or brightest. It doesn't mean it's the most uh, needed. It doesn't mean anything other than it's a uh, random uh, in the way the selection is made. 
now we're looking at who's being paid uh, the highest wage or the, you know, wage level four versus, you know, wage level three. And, um, you know, it's, it's not like a, Biden can just come in and reverse this rule. Uh, with this rule, you know, the option is still there for USCIS to implement. Uh, and I, I reference this because, you know, last year was the first year we had the new uh, registration process. Employees uh, use their passport number, date of birth, um, if they were a master's cap, regular cap, uh, so on and so forth, to be selected. And then after we're, they were selected, we have permission to go ahead and file the LCA. And at that point in time, we would know the wage offered and things like this. Now, with this new rule, I don't know if there's going to be enough time uh, or if there's even been any work done to, to implement this new rule within the current system. So what this means is if the, the new administration wants to proceed it, utilizing this rule, we would probably have to go back to uh, paper filings and be selected in a lottery that way. Uh, you know, we keep the same system that we used last year. And, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some lawsuits or some other things happen between now and, you know, the year after it's fiscal year 2023 before, you know, we have any commitment to this rule, but it's erasing the rule or writing a new rule to, to get rid of it. Okay. Uh, Lucas, sorry, you can say in between the audio is, uh, is fluctuation. Just uh, have a look. Is any internet issues uh, that you want? It, can you hear me fine? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, Lucas, you uh, you, you uh, given more uh, important and interesting point on immigration system. We can go for the step by step or point point to point. First, we can discuss about the travel ban. He extended to the March until uh, March thirty first. The same rule will apply. What we what it was in December thirty first, or uh, did he add any points to uh, ban the travel or uh, the visa suspension until March 31st. So pretty much uh, everything on that, on the ban itself, uh, addressing specific non-immigrant visas and certain green card um, uh, petitions or, uh, or applications, uh, it remains more or less the same. Now, there's been a few lawsuits. Uh, most notably, there's one with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, that allows their members to be exempt from this ban. So there's a court order and we've been able to, um, you know, send employees who work for companies who are members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, along with the court order to go ahead and get stamped. Um, now, what we started the show off discussing where uh, there's a new uh, ban on any traveler who's not who doesn't have proof of the vac vaccination. Um, you know, that's another caveat. So the first ban is just basically about the stamp receiving the stamp, you know, at the local uh, consulate or, or embassy. And then, um, you know, the second one is the actual entrance into the United States. So, you know, it, it is something that we have to monitor and, we, and it's just another loop that, or hoop that we have to jump through uh, with all these requirements. Okay. You said it's a vaccination. That is um, the very important to between the two countries. I'm not sure the the United States or whatever approved the vaccination, not exactly the Indian government. Let's say uh, if any traveler took a vaccination from India, which were, which which is approved by Indian government, the what is the uh, proof we need to show to the travel while taking the on board? We well, so, see that's. That's a very good question. I don't know all the specifics yet. Um, uh, obviously, you would have proof of vaccination would be some type of record. Usually, they'll give you a card or you would be registered in a database that you could upload. I, I know, you know, right now, if you were to travel back home uh, to even to go to India, you have to show that you're uh, COVID uh, negative. So you have to upload that uh, as an itinerary with the airlines or with the embassy here prior to travel. Um, so there's probably something like that. Another important, you know, 
issue we need to, to highlight is the two existing vaccines here in the United States. I believe the technology is mRNA, uh, which allows, you know, it, it's not so much of a traditional vaccine in the sense as it is, uh, um, it's, a, it's a newer style of vaccine. So, you know, what vaccine is India developing? Is it the same technology? Is it the same strength? Is it the, you know, are we talking apples to apples or is there going to be even more prolonged uh, travel ban because people aren't able to get the same vaccine that the United States recognizes as being a viable vaccine? So we have a lot of these issues that are going to be coming up that we need to see how the government's going to address this and, uh, you know, how long uh, this this uh, requirement is going to be extended. Okay. So the, the second question is, uh, uh, still it means uh, almost uh, six to seven months, uh, the conflict is not open. It means it giving only the emergency, the visas for H H4 or fam family. Most of I see the H4s. Do you have any information this uh, these days are open for the H uh, H1, L1 and uh, the business visas? Yes. So like what, like what we were saying a minute ago, um, if your petitioning company is a member of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, there's been a court order, you know, within the past uh, six weeks that allows members of that uh, Chamber of Commerce to have their employees be exempt from this presidential proclamation. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, you know, certain things we can do. And, and like I've always said on all the shows we've done, we always want to look at everyone's case as a unique uh, case. So, you know, the petitioning organization might qualify, uh, the beneficiary or the employee uh, might qualify based upon, you know, working with some database that helps manage, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, supply chain management or something like this with COVID vaccinations or some other uh, healthcare requirement. You know, we can work out and try and get, you know, some of these, uh, uh, exemptions, you know, pass through so they can get stamped. Okay. Okay. So you already spoke about the new ladder system 2022 cap. Mm -hmm. So even we don't, we don't have much, as you said, is we don't have much information, which process is going to be implemented. All right. So by your, it means as your experience, it means what do you think Maybe uh, USCIS might be implemented some X Y Z process. If you if you expect if if you expect just to give me the, some some more information so that we can just uh, just for awareness. Well, I just to back up a little bit and give everyone an overall uh, picture of what's happening. Okay, so Trump. And we're focused right now, our conversation on H1s, GC, things like this, H4, uh, overall to the entire system, asylum, TPS, temporary protected status, deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA, and other programs, uh, diversity visas. Uh, Trump has done a lot to change how these uh, visas function and limiting people to have access to this, even going to immigration court they've changed a lot of rules. So here at the last days of his presidency in last weeks, he's been just throwing all these rules and changes out as fast as he can. Um, most of the time it's a violation of the rulemaking procedures that are put in place uh, under the administrative procedures act. Uh, but there's some like this H one B cap rule that was, that followed the rules. Uh, and so it has become a final rule. Now, why this is so uh, important is uh, the new president who might have the opposite view of what this rules intended effect might be. He just can't, he or she just can't go and, and change the rule. It has to go back through the rulemaking process. It has to have a valid reason to change. And, uh, you know, we have to go through that process or Congress could just, you know, write a law and change the law itself uh, to change this. So, to, to give you an idea, there's been so many changes and so much damage done uh, that it is going to take the new administration, you know, probably a few weeks or months to get every to understand what's happened and what's changed. So 
um, since this requirement with the new ru rule would more or less require the employers to file the cap cases like we have in the past where every person we file, we have to print out all the evidence, file the LCA, and then let it be selected. Uh, since we used a new system, there might not be, you know, enough time to integrate the new system to accommodate this new uh, bidding process, so to speak, for cap selection. So, you know, I, I really believe that more, more likely than not, we're going to be able to sidestep this rule this year and we'll be able to still use a traditional random selection in the lottery process. Um, also, a, a key caveat is this rule does not change the selection process for master's cap versus regular cap. So that's still going to remain the same uh, moving forward. But, you know, um, there is a lot of changes and it is going to take the administration some time to understand what has done, happened, what is happening and what they can do to change what will be happening. <laughs> so it's a lot of things at one time. <clears throat> okay. So by this uh, new rule, highest uh, wage level. So we already discussed the last session in last session. Uh, if you give the some more information, how they can select uh, petitions, applications. So we have the level four, level three, level two, level one. Can you give the more information? At the same time, um, uh, OFC data is a, is a wage level is a different, uh, the number depending on the cities and uh, uh, tier one, tier two cities. So if go for the wage level, how the USCS will decide the petitioner in, in, in the same category, maybe California is a high, high, higher wages, but not in uh, Austin, Houston, or maybe second level cities or some second level of cities. Can you give them more information on this one? And maybe you can elaborate how USC is going to be too. So, yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, just to draw into context, and is a simple method of showing how this is not going to work. Um, you know, we have someone who's, that most of our audience would understand, they're, they're software developers, okay? And let's just use the software developer uh, SOC code 151132. Okay, based upon the Occupational Outlook Handbook and ONET with, with all the data that's there, uh, it says a bachelor's degree is typically required for entrance into that occupation. So if you have a bachelor's degree with little or no experience, that, put, that would have you at level, wage level one on that position. Uh, if you require a master's degree for that, for that position, it would require wage level two. If you supervise people, it would go up a wage level, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you, uh, if you are comparing who gets paid the most for level of education, let's say that you're also an engineer, but a civil engineer, okay? Typically, civil engineers almost always require, you know, 100%, they have to have a bachelor's degree. Um, and then on top of that, some require a master's degree, depending on the certification, licensure, and things like this. So is one engineer is not always equal to a, a, a different engineer, right? For software developers, you're not required to get a license. For civil engineers, usually you're required to have a license. Um, let's say also that uh, I want to hire an attorney on H-1B. Well, an attorney requires uh, an advanced degree beyond bachelor's. So a Juris Doctorate degree is a, is a doctorate degree. Um, and so if I start out as a, an attorney with little to no experience, my wage level is still going to be wage level one, even though I have a higher degree. So on its face, you can see the challenges about this. So is it just someone who has a bachelor's degree? Is it a bachelor's degree with... Um, you know, also the state licensure. Is it uh, a, an advanced degree that's usually required to perform the duties in that in that field? So just looking at that alone to get to the baseline to determine what the wage levels are, you have a lot of disparity with, you know, requirements of what, what needs to be done for the job. So just alone looking at it from there, uh, it's an unfair system, it's arbitrary, and it's something that probably, you know, 
I think would be easily challenged in court. The problem would be the timing of everything. You know, is there enough time between now and uh, March to have something done? And that's something I really don't know uh, the answer to. And and we would have to wait and see kind of how things move, what the administration, you know, uh, states and how how things start uh, after the 20th of January. I think this is a very, uh, it means we need to discuss a very broader way because of uh, the level of complexity in wages, uh, the segment, because the H1, it falls the engineers, all engineers, the software engineers, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, and uh, at the same time, other department kind of uh, healthcare doctors, right? Uh, right. Maybe doctors also, it fall into the same segment if they want to apply in H1. So here we have a question from Vishnu Vardhan is asking that, uh, let's say if any applicant have the master plus two years of experience in seg- a specific segment in machine learning engineer, this will comes under L2 or L3? Or if I want to, yeah. Yes, uh, Lucas. So uh, thanks for the question, Vishal. Uh, what we look at when we determine wage levels, is not so much your own background or your own expertise, uh, what's on your CV. We look at what the position requires. So it's just like if you look at on DICE or anywhere else and you're looking for a position, it's going to list the requirements. So if you're a, like a ServiceNow developer, DevOps engineer, you know, you need to have this much knowledge. You need to understand the you know, database management. You have to have, you know, whatever it might be. The requirements are there with the minimum uh, education level that usually they'll say you, you need a bachelor's degree and then uh, however many years of experience. That data or that information is what we use to determine the appropriate wage level, not so much what your CV reflects, um, if that makes sense. So that's another reason why this process would be arbitrary is because if, if I have a fresher coming out of school uh, with the master's and like one year experience, how can I um, legally uh, uh, list a wage level four uh, whenever that person obviously doesn't have meet the requirements of what wage level four would be? So it's a huge problem. And, you know, a lot of people uh, assume that a wage level four re- reflects the person who's do- re- working on the job individually. But in fact, it, the the wage levels in the SOC code is is directly about the position itself. So it doesn't matter if one person works in the position or 10 people, that the position and the requirements in that position are, are what determine the appropriate wage levels uh, to be ad- assigned. Okay. So, Evans, um, by this new rule, the, who will affect for applying this, apply for the new H1? Mostly... Yeah, I mean, it'll, it, it'll be for the lottery. It's not going to be. So if, if I'm going for, uh, if I need an extension myself, uh, I'm already cap exempt, then I, it's not going to apply to me. Uh, it's basically going to be, you know, people coming in um, to the, this, the H-1B process fresh. <laughs> so, um, you know, basically anyone who currently has H-1B or is, maybe in a different status, but uh, cap exempt because they previously had one in the past, it's nothing to worry about um, for them. It's basically people who are in uh, F1 status, the OPTs, CPTs, um, STEM OPTs, those are primarily the people that would be affected with this. Okay. Let's say the new rule uh, is going to be implemented and uh, uh, the USCS got... uh, 65,000 petition from the level four. So we'll get a chance to L3 and L4, or how does it work? Well, I don't know specifically how they would administer that because uh, obviously we just discussed in the beginning, the the order of selection with masters versus regular cap is is still going to remain the same. So, uh, you know, masters preference would go first and then, um, I, and then the remaining, but the the issue is, um, you know, how how can they 
do a process that's not arbitrary. And I think that's the key uh, idea behind this is that the selection process here is not fair. Uh, it's not a blind lottery like what's been in the past, which would be a fair way of processing the, the, the visas with a limited quantity. Uh, here, they're more or less evaluating and judging people. So now, is it not just like what you mentioned? How do you determine if everyone's level four? I mean, are they going to start looking uh, and say, well, a doctor is more important than an uh, engineer and an engineer is more important than a, you know, a civil engineer. I mean, wh how do we determine this and how far down does the, the rabbit hole will this go, you know, affecting all the H1Bs? That's why I'm, I really feel pretty confident that at least this year, I think we're going to be able to steer clear of any issues with this, you know. Okay. So, I think uh, this is um, the Trump is brought again. This is already IFR interim final rule on which are uh, which was about to implement on October six, but the courts are suspended. Those one again, the Trump is uh, trying to enforce this new rule. So, is there any chance to any law firm go to the court and get a? Uh, uh, maybe is there any chance to stop this new rule to implement or? So in the past with the IFR rules, what has made those lawsuits successful is the challenge that, the uh, you know, they're not, it, it, the process wasn't fair the way the government uh, addressed everything. So the courts uh, were issuing injunctions and decisions based upon the merits of what possible damage would be there. Uh, by petitioners or, or whomever. Um, and so what we're showing is that there's potential harm, the rules weren't followed, and that we should that we should have a pause or an injunction uh, pending the, you know, hearing the merits of the case. When the rules are followed like they were with this rule, that option is not necessarily there. So when we go and file a lawsuit challenging this, we have to show actual harm. We'd have to show actual you know, other evidence that wouldn't exist until after the cap selection process, if that makes sense. So it's a matter of, of uh, the way the government did the rule uh, and how legally we would be able to challenge. So under the IFR, the lawsuits were able to proceed because the government did not follow the rules and we could show that there was harm. Since the government followed the rules on, on this case, uh, uh, on this rule, uh, we would have to wait till there's actual harm uh, and then challenge it from there. Okay. So I think uh, we can get more information by next week or maybe next after a couple of weeks to what what is the take on then maybe Biden new administration or maybe USCS new staff. So we can we can go for the next question. Oh, what is the current situation in H1, exemption cap H1? Do you see any issues or any denials? Is any complicated RFS recently? Or everyone getting three years uh, extension or still getting only the one year, two years? Or what is? What did you uh, observe last couple of months? Uh, everything's still, you know, trending in a positive direction with that. Um, you know, we're still getting three-year extensions. The additional requirements for um, employer-employee relationship, third-party outside employment uh, are all still, you know, not required. They were, you know, uh, from the, the IT serve lawsuit uh, settlement. So, uh, you know, overall, I think what we're looking at is, you know, obviously maintaining status, uh, education, evaluations, things like that to make sure that we have if you have a foreign degree that we show that we have a evaluation showing you have the equivalent of a U.S. bachelor's degree, um, but that, that's pretty much it. Everything else is, is more or less uh, smooth sailing uh, compared to last year. Um, I do want to mention we, we have a new president <clears throat> and vice president. And the vice president, is, as you know, and probably most of yours know, uh, Kamala Harris, you know, she is uh, – her mother's from uh, – uh, you know, South India and Tamil Nadu. 
and uh you know she's already you know obviously is a she's born here but she has tied uh you know to her parents were immigrants and she's already made a statement i think today that they're already starting their agenda looking at how they can fix a lot of these backlogs uh fix a lot of the court cases help people who are in need and i think you know just like how we've heard about the vaccination protocols how we start out with certain groups frontline workers elderly people you know and it goes down and down in tears uh i think what they've addressed at the beginning is they're wanting to talk about people who are in temporary protected status to help them through the gc process the daca recipients um and to help alleviate the backlog with immigration courts and i think that's what i would call tier one and i think tier two uh, is going to include uh, getting rid of this backlog for employment based, and I think that that, like I was saying for the past few months, I, I really believe that that's on the agenda. And, and uh, even if we filed adjustments here this, you know, in October, or November, uh, there is a good chance that this the clock could speed up and the backlogs could be, you know, moved, you know, uh, to the point where we don't have one. And everyone, you know, uh, hopefully can transition from H1 to GEC, uh, you know, in a short period of time. Okay. Lucas, we got another question from YouTube. Uh, Vishnu Vardhan. I mean, are there any laws to fill on the lottery system? I think we already sp uh, spoke about this one. Maybe you can give the one small answer. So... Other. No lawsuits at the moment. Um, this lawsuit's going to require us, you know, to wait until something happens. Now, there's still a, a possibility we're not going to have um, the system impact us this year. So, you know, touch wood, I think the best thing to do would be if we could keep the old system that's not integrated uh, with needing an LCA to be filed. And then that leaves us the rest of the year more or less to uh, have some type of either a lawsuit uh, or for Congress to address this issue, this rule and make sure it's not, um, you know, there for the future. Thanks, Vishnu, for your questions. So, Lucas, we can go for next um, segment is the H4. H4 is a hot topic uh, recent recent months. Do you have any updates uh, about the applications approvals or EAD approvals or biometric, even biometrics are getting delays. Do you have any information on that one? Well, you know, this has been a very difficult year for H H4, probably a year and a half. You know, when it first started uh, with the biometrics requirement, um, there was delay and we would, you know, instead of receiving approval within two weeks to six weeks, depending on, you know, how fast, if, if premium was used with the principal H1B <laughs> visa holder, um, you know, we would see it in a traditional way, you know, kind of going longer and longer uh, based upon the availability of biometrics appointments and things like this. And now when you add this pandemic, you know, with all these uh, appointments canceled, having to be rescheduled, we're getting extreme delays right now in approvals, you know, up to six, seven months in some circumstances. And a lot of that, uh, the delay is based upon where you live. So if you live here in Dallas, uh, where I am, there's a large uh, population that depend on these visas and there's only so many uh, offices, so many appointments. Now, if you live in um, Omaha, Nebraska or Oklahoma City, there's fewer people and there's uh, the appointments might be more abundant uh, based upon where you live. So it might, you know, help the processing time with that because there's fewer people uh, in line and you get the biometrics completed <clears throat> sooner. Okay. So the recent issues, the same biometric is uh, the one, one step is the huddling the H4 process. Mm -hmm. So what do you think in uh, Biden administration will remove or still remain biometric? I think we discussed, you know, in the past, I think I think the administration has to do an honest uh, review uh, of what is is important for the safety and welfare of the American people. Number one. And number two, you know, how many 
criminals or, or what, what purpose uh, for doing this extra fees or the extra expense is there. So we have to do a cost benefit analysis with the new administration. And, and part of that is also going to be looking at these fees. You know, recently USCIS uh, had the permission from Congress to increase the fees from 1440 to 2500. Um, you know, what is the real budgeting concerns for this? It, you know, is, is that necessary? Is it unnecessary? You know, and that's something that, that will need to be reviewed is how, you know, and, and also right now there's been quite a few additional um, site visits, you know, just random site visits and uh, by the uh, FDNS and, uh, you know, how much of a burden is that uh, on the budget and everything else and on, on processing of, of these non-immigrant visas, uh, you know, so that everything has to have a cost benefit uh, to it. And, if this is a wasted uh, process or a wasted step, hopefully the administration can determine that and we go back to the way things were where you you didn't have to have biometrics done. Okay. Lucas, uh, about the H4 biometric here, I have one point. Maybe you can uh, give the appropriate direction about this question. Let's say if I uh, spoke local senator, congressman or a senator or congressman, hey, the H4 biometric is, the process is uh, a long waiting process to get the EAD. If, ex if we explain our pain to the local senator and congressman, if they had a, dis maybe if they have a discussion with the uh, Biden administration, what real pain in, uh, in H4 EADs, this will, can can we do like this to uh, get avoid the biometric NH4 process, or what do you think, or what do you what do you your suggestion on this one? Well, 100%. can we approach? Yeah, can we approach to the senator or congressman, local senator and congressman, or yeah, just view your, your point of view. One hundred percent. That's that's part of you know, what their role and responsibility uh, is, is to, you know, serve the constituency. Uh, so they want that feedback and they want to know uh, this. And, and, you know, we have a saying here in the United States, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So if we have enough people mentioning this or enough people talking about the backlog, you know, please help reduce the backlog, please help reduce the wait times. Um, that will help address the issue. Uh, additionally, you know, they have a, every congressman and senator, they have liaison uh, office that will help if, if your case has, you know, been exceeding normal processing times or there's some other issue, they'll reach out on your behalf and try and help and see, you know, if there's any issues that they can help with to speed the process up. So it is a resource. Uh, you know, we use quite a bit and, and the resource is there for everyone. And, um, and people shouldn't be afraid to reach out for help because, um, you know, we want things to run smooth. We want things to, to you know, you pay, a, you pay these fees. You should be able to receive uh, the benefits you're seeking if you qualify for them. And it shouldn't be delayed by months at a time. Okay. <clears throat> There is a chance if you if you if we talk talk to senator and uh, congressman, there is a chance to speed up or maybe they can bring to uh, Biden ad new administration or maybe USCS, right? So that's a good right. good news actually. So uh, Lucas, we can go for the next segment is green card. So green card. First, we talk about the I one forty. We discussed a lot of things about the higher wages for the PERM uh, H1 application. And also the higher wages will apply for the PERM green card also. So already we discussed uh, what are the steps and uh, how we can apply based on uh, wage levels or levels, level four to level three. How does apply for the green card? The, the same way, level four, level three, level one, level level two, level one, or how does it how does apply to green card? So you, it's a very good question. So um, there's a caveat here. When we apply for green card, we have to request a prevailing wage uh, 
from the Department of Labor. And there's an officer who reviews our job description, uh, our education requirements, and any other special skills, uh, supervisory duties um, like this, and they'll determine the appropriate SOC code and wage level. Uh, now we can, if we get a, something we don't agree with, we can always get, ask for redetermination. Uh, and that, that's more or less, you know, there's a way of doing it where we can always determine, you know, what the wage level should be based upon how we uh, re make the request based upon the, re the position. Uh, when we file LCAs, there's just so many LCAs to be filed for H1s that um, in the past, you could always request a prevailing wage determination. Uh, and that's what you had to do in the beginning, in fact. Uh, but there were so many uh, people requesting this and the delays were so long that it was uh, not practical um, for that to work. So uh, you, the employers, the petitioners have the ability to choose the appropriate wage level and SOC code uh, using the correct methods of why they're selecting, uh, you know, those SOC codes not to pay the least or to pay the most, but you know, to have it really reflect what the position requirements are. And um, so that's the two main differences with that, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. So about green card, the 485 October applications, do you have any updates on the one? Um, all or uh, get the receipt who applied in October month or? I've uh, been getting all the receipts. Uh, it's been no issue, just like we discussed last October. Uh, there's no need to have been, you know, using, a, I think a lot of people were talking about using the same uh, labor that was originally filed for downgrades and all that. That's uh, completely not true. Um, so, you know, other than that, all the receipts are coming in. I have heard from uh, other people, not anyone that we filed a case for, but uh, I think there was some rejections uh, for family members where, uh, let's say you didn't select that it was an I-140 employment-based uh, petition uh, on the adjustment of status that that was that would be rejected. So there, we might have a few viewers out there right now that might have experienced that. Um, I, you should be able to refile, uh, you know, and, and and not lose the opportunity. But uh, that, again, that's more of a case by case basis. If, if it has happened to anyone uh, who's paying it, who's watching right now, then please, you know, reach out to Venkat or myself and we can try and help uh, resolve that issue for you. OK, yeah. Maybe if you have any 485 adjustment of status application issues, maybe you can reach out to info at uh, BG IMM log, log. You can send an email to BG IMM at log, log .com. Uh, Lucas, uh, what is an interesting point? Uh, I got noticed, it means I got a couple of um, the question. Uh, one applic application have the primary application and uh, primary applicant and uh, spouse and kid. The primary applicant and uh, spouse got the receipt, but not kid. So what is the reason did not get the for the kid? Well, it could be just delayed, uh, and that's probably more or less what the issue is. Um, and you have to remember, so they all these applications go through Lockbox, uh, and we're looking at and Lockbox to make sure that the packages are complete. Uh, money orders are or checks are appropriately uh, affixed to the the applications with the correct amounts, uh, and then all everything scanned and process to go on to the officer. So at that time when that happens, the, it, the receipts are processed and, and submitted. Um, you know, depending on the age of the kids, uh, maybe they don't, there's not a requirement, you know, for the receipt at that time, or maybe to not have biometrics, uh, depending on the age. So there's a lot of factors that could, you know, be involved with this. But in fact, the receipt would just be, uh, delayed uh but we should expect to to have all the receipts issued within a, a standard amount of time okay everyone thought is uh, we are applying the one single bundle right if if primary applicant 
uh, got the receipt, the all applicants should be get the receipt. That's why little, it means little, little confusion and a little worried why uh, kid did, did not get the, the receipt number. It's not always the same. So we're looking at each uh, package, even if it's a family unit, each package in itself is its own filing. So we always want to make sure that even though we file everything together, that we keep in mind that uh, e each application is its own case. Okay. And let's say uh, if any applicant received the uh, receipt by December 31st or January 1st, though, when, he, when can he expect the biometric? Within one, two, one or two weeks? Or how much time it will take for the biometric? It really depends on where you're located. So I know, Venkat, you're in Houston. You know, Houston probably has, you know, out of 4 million people, I'm sure a large percentage of those 4 million are immigrants themselves and have probably have some reliance on getting biometrics. So the appointments, uh, wait time for Houston would be very long. Probably the same as if you're in uh, Los Angeles or if you're in Dallas or Florida, Miami, Florida. You know, there's long lines because there's so many people using the system. If you go to like Wichita, Kansas, uh, you know, you, you might get an appointment within two weeks after getting your receipt. So it really just goes, it's a, it's a first in first out process or FIFO. And, uh, you know, it really depends on where you live and what's the, the you know, the local, um, biometrics, uh, facility. Okay. So now the time is everyone getting, uh, receipts. Uh, October applicant of 485, maybe the receipts, maybe sooner, maybe next couple of months or maybe after six months, everyone get uh, authorization card and uh, uh, advanced payroll, right? Mm -hmm. So it means what I hear is uh, until, up, uh, until we get the advanced payroll document, approved document, we should not travel to outside of United States, right? So right. what, what if, if, any, if any emergency? So can you so, give them more information on that one? Correct. So the, it, the rule is this. Uh, you should stay in the United States till you receive advanced parole. Now, having said that, obviously we're living in a pandemic at the moment. Uh, I know I've been involved with quite a few people who've had parents who are sick or who have it parents who have expired and, and it's a difficult time. And obviously you have to go be there with family and take care of that situation. When we have extraordinary events like this, the, you know, it, it's not an automatic denial if you leave and, and come back. It's something we could probably address uh, because it's, you know, um, but it is a case by case basis. It's not a guarantee for anyone. Uh, and that's something that we should, you know, uh, make sure we, we remember. But uh, for the most part, if you do depart for any reason, um, it, it's kind of a, looked upon as abandoning the process and they could reject or uh, deny your adjustment of status at that point. Okay. So in this case, we need to, maybe you said it's a case by case, so we need to contact to the authority and take the necessary right. steps to process it. Yeah. Correct. And, and so we have another layer of difficulty now. So let's say uh, the person who has GC pending doesn't have advanced parole yet. Well, they go uh, home and they're going to need to ha make sure they have a valid stamp to come back in. Well, right now, maybe they can't get stamped or the drop box is not available for them. Uh, then also maybe we have another caveat where that you need a vaccination for COVID. Well, maybe you can't get vaccination for some time. So there's a lot of additional issues uh, where in the past, maybe you, you're you gone for two weeks for a family emergency or three weeks. Now that could be three months, you see. So there's a whole a whole other complexity here with, with the time, how far you're outside the country, when you come back in, uh, they, they can cause... Uh, obviously difficulty with the processing of the case. Okay. So one question, uh, Lucas, about this uh, downgraded EB2 to EB3. 
So we applied again the I-140. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, will we get the EAD and advanced payroll even I-140 in process, under process? Correct. You So you what you're referring to is if you file the application concurrently with I-140. So obviously, as soon as the, the adjustment of status application is filed, uh, the EAD and the advanced parole are also in process. So even if there's an issue with I-140, until the adjustment of status application is denied or rejected or whatever reason, um, you'll still be able to get EAD and advanced parole regardless of whatever happens with I-140. Now, obviously, if I-140 is denied, your adjustment is going to be denied as well, but it's not always all within the same uh, it's not all the same case processing at the same time, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, here one scenario. And let's say um, the recently EB3 got dis December 31st, 2000, maybe January 1st, 2015, right? So if any person applied the pre date of uh, December 24, 2015, is downgraded to the EB2 to EB3, he applied, right? For some reason, I-140 got denied, but uh, 485 is still under process. Even so, we we don't we don't get any final action date, right? In this scenario, that applicant will get the EAD or advanced parole. Well, it'll probably still be in process, but it, usually the adjustment will get an RFE or a denial letter too. Uh, based upon the fact that the I-140 was denied, it's just not going to happen at the exact same time. So I-140 will be in process once the decision or whatever happens to it's made. Usually it's about another four weeks or so before the adjustment application uh, gets a denial or whatnot. So uh, as soon as the adjustment's denied, even if your card says it's valid till 2022, um, it, you know, they'll... They'll, if it's denied, then you lose that benefit, right? Okay. The advance, even um, I-140 in process, we will get the EAD, right? Yeah, so as long as the adjustment's filed and it's pending, um, and what pending means is obviously you don't have final action dates, so the adjustment's pending based upon your I-140. So let's say I-140 takes a year for it to be processed and approved. Well, you, since your uh, adjustment's pending and it was filed, you have the ability to get um, EAD and advanced parole, and that comes in a one-year increment. So the following year, you get a chance to renew. And hopefully uh, this year, we don't have to renew so many times and they, they address the backlog so we can finalize these GCs. But, you know, I've, I've known of people waiting two or three, four years renewing every year because the dates retrogress and move and go back, go forward, go back. And, and um, you know, it, so there are some odd scenarios where that happens. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so Lucas, uh, we about to reach, maybe we have the five minutes time. You can share if you want anything we missed or maybe if you want to share any, any, any additional information on immigration system on current uh, Trump administration or Biden administration, just you can share. I think uh, you had a very excellent point earlier about contacting representatives and congressmen, uh, I'm sorry, and senators. Uh, now would be a, a wonderful time for people to maybe reach out and say, you know, I've been here on H-1B visa for uh, 10 years. I just now recently filed for green card. There's a backlog. It looks like it's going to be another three or four years before I even get a chance for this process. I might have a kid. The kid might age out. What can we do to address these problems? And if we have enough people from, you know, the uh, this point of view in the employment-based backlog, if we have enough people reaching out and maybe discussing this with the Congress uh, person and the Senator, uh, maybe that will help move the needle whenever it comes time for Congress to do something or 
for the administration to do something that there's that we have enough input to, to fix the problem. And that's what I would recommend and uh, request that everyone, you know, do is, is to everyone work together and uh, let the local uh, representative know these issues. And also the two, there's two state senators for every state. I mean, I'm sorry, two senators for every state. Uh, you know, we want to make sure they know as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lucas, today's session. And um, you've given a lot of uh, information about the Trump administration and uh, new coming the Biden administration. Hopefully, uh, the new Biden administration will take a smooth process on H1 immigration and green card process. As, as we're discussing from long, a couple of months ago, uh, about the green card, uh, maybe he will brought the new comprehensive bill and get clear on long waiting green card process. Uh, at the same time, is H one is a, a very toughest part uh, in wage, wage highly wages uh, highly wages lottery system. Maybe Biden administration will take a action and uh, get simplified and uh, everyone get the H one application. H1, everyone will fall into the H1 application system. Uh, we'll see the next couple of weeks. So thank you. Thank you, Lucas. And uh, thanks for uh, joining today who watching or uh, you who, who posted the questions. Please join every Wednesday 6 p.m. Central Time on television or radio. Get more information on the immigration system. These are uh, we are discrimination. This is not final uh, answers. Maybe just we are trying to bring this information to awareness to the community. Don't take on this final action, final point or final decision making. If you have any complicated issues or if you have any, um, maybe if you want any information, just reach out to us. We can give the more information. We can guide you the right direction and uh, we are ready to help to the community. You can reach out to the Burgos and Garrison law frame or you can send an email to the info at bgimmlaw.com or you can email to the info telegram or radio at gmail.com. Please uh, tune every Wednesday 6 p.m. on YouTube channel, telegram or YouTube channel or telegram or radio Facebook and get more information on immigration, the current immigration and the future immigration questions or topics. You can post your questions or you can post your topic on Facebook page and we can ready to discuss or we, we are ready to help to you. Thank you, Lucas. Thanks for joining today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much to the session. We will, we will catch next week. Until bye bye. Thank you. Good, good evening. Good night.